I know some of it was pretty damn long, if you actually did it all. <laughs> um, and th this is, so I don't know if you figured it out yet or not, but I'm writing these homework problems. I'm not pulling them from resources, I'm just writing them. And on occasion, I'll write a problem which seems like really concise and short and everything. And most of the time I work them out before I assign them to you, but sometimes I don't. I'm like, it's so obvious that this is doable, but I forget how complicated it can get. So I apologize for the length of that homework assignment, but like hopefully if you did like the first example of the Gram Schmidt in the homework, then that was enough to do the quiz questions and you didn't have to do the second version, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, at any rate, all right. I have a question. Yeah. In the homework, I think like a couple times you've asked us to sort of find a similarity transformation. Is there a systematic way to find it? Because it seems difficult to intuit a matrix and its inverse, which would be the thing you want to prove. Yeah, I can't think of a, I mean. Like that was one of the things you asked us to do. Yeah. And I Um, yeah, I, I just sit and work it out. I mean, it, I don't have a shortcut to doing it. But like work it out how? Um, I mean, like long entries in a matrix filters one and two vectors. But you also need its inverse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have nine, you have nine unknowns, but you're equating a matrix with another, ma it, this is if you know the four, beginning matrix and the final matrix that you're trying to get to, and you're trying to find the, the similarity transformation. So the similarity transformation itself has nine unknowns in a three by three case, mm -hmm. but you get nine equations. Because mm -hmm. each element of the old matrix has to match up to the element of the new matrix, and there's nine elements. Okay. So you get a system of nine equations and nine unknowns. Hopefully it's a simpler system than you know, some highly nonlinear thing. Are you smiling or frowning? I can't tell. I'm squinting. <laughs> oh, you're squinting. Well, I could tell your eyes were squinting. Your eyes were getting skinny. Can you not do it with eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Well, it depends because uh, some, some, so she's talking about a general similarity transformation, which doesn't have to be a transformation composed of eigenvectors. Yeah, yeah, in certain cases it's straightforward. You grab the eigenvectors, you form a matrix out of it, and then you use that. But in, in general, you just have to solve a system of equations. Okay? Well, if you guys are worried, I'll give you more practice. I'll assign another homework problem for you to find elements of a similarity transformation. I've got no problem doing that. You don't have to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, Anna, I threw your name. You're, I'm going to ask you a question. I, uh, I sort of ended the last lecture with these three uh, theorems. And I just want you to point out to me which one is the strongest. When you say strongest, what do you mean by strongest? Well, I actually discussed what I meant by I strength. How all-encompassing, you get a result with a minimum amount of okay. input to the result. So which one, which, which of these applies to the largest class of transformations? I think one, because it's not specified in our, like, our unitary space. That's true, that's true. But compared to two, these are definitely covering a broader class, of, there are any transformations. The second one is only the uh, self-adjoint transformations. Okay. okay. But then of the three things that have to be satisfied, which, which one is uh, a smaller amount that has to be satisfied in order for the three. previous thing to be true? Three? Well, it's two and three, because two and three are the same. 
So the third is definitely the strongest of these because it covers a large class of operations, but it requires the least to be satisfied. Okay, now, I say that because we're doing physics. We're not doing math. We're do well, we're doing math in this class, but we want to learn math to do physics. And the one problem, so notice, notice uh, this is anything. This can be real or imaginary or real or complex space. This can be only a real space. This, though, is a complex space. A unitary space is a complex vector space. However, in physics, in the real world, how many complex things are there? Lots. Lots? I mean complex as in a real and an imaginary part. In physics, and by physics I mean the things that you go out and measure. Nothing. Oh. Nothing. Nothing in reality is, is complex. Okay? So there's a question of how much you can actually get away with complexity in the mathematical description when in doing physics, you're restricted to real quantities, okay? And you might say, well, just screw it. Don't use complex numbers, just use real numbers. That way everything's real anyway. Is that true? If we only use real things, then we only get real things out? No, what are the eigenvalues of a rotation matrix? E to the i theta and e to the i theta. One, and e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta. Okay, so that starts out with something totally real and it just spits out complexities, okay? So um, it would be nice to find a way to work with complex things so that we can use their mathematical sophistication. I mean, this complex space gives us this very powerful result, but you know, are there ways to, to work with complex quantities and somehow always get real quantities out? And the answer is yes. And this, of course, is why the notion of Hermitian operators plays such an important role, okay? So for Hermitian operators, um, there are a couple of properties of Hermitian operators which turn out to be extremely useful in physics. So first off, a linear transformation A on a unitary space, so this is a complex space, is Hermitian. Now I've already defined Hermitian for you, but I'm going to give you a different not definition, this is a theorem, but it's a different criterion by which you can evaluate whether something is Hermitian or not. If and only if the inner product of a vector with the transformed version of the vector is real for all x. Give you another one. The eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real. So it seems as if, if we select Hermitian operators, and does everybody remember the definition of Hermitian? What's the definition? One operator? Yes. Yeah, so Hermitian, Hermitian means that A is equal to A dagger where if you're on a complex space, this is A transpose and complex conjugated, okay? It turns out that this particular type of operator has these lovely properties. These 
these lovely properties, even though they're in, even though they're dealing with complex operators acting on complex vector spaces, the quantities that spit out are always real. So these quantities could correspond to measured things, do they? Yes. Really? No. What? No. What do they correspond to? So this corresponds to the expectation value of the operator A with respect to the state X in quantum theory. That is, if you have the state X and you have many instances of it, and you want to know what is going to be the average realistic measured quantity over that distribution, then that's given by the expectation value of the operator A. So if A is a momentum operator, it will give you the average momentum. Okay? What about the eigenvalues? Exactly, these give you the measurable outcomes of the measurements, or uh, not measurable, uh, no, don't like that. Um. <laughs> I'll just see what I have. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, the results. Everything going on here, but the eigenvalues are the actual values that you can get if you do a single measurement. So these are so important that I'm going to prove both of them. Okay? All right? So let's start with the first one. And we'll do if first, and then we'll do if only if. So if A is Hermitian, then X, AX, okay, that's the quantity we want to determine something about, is equal to, okay, remember the definition of Hermitian is that if you have the inner product and the operators acting on the one on the right or the left, to move it to the other one, you just dagger it. Okay? Now, the operator's remission, so I can replace a dagger here with a. Say one thing and write another. It's a magical of mine. Okay. And now what we can do is we can remember that if you have the inner product of two quantities and you want to commute those quantities, what's the only thing you have to do? You have to complex conjugate it. So this is going to be the same as x a x complex conjugate. Okay? And here you go. If something is equal, is exactly equal to its complex conjugate, what is that quantity? Real. It's real. Now that's assuming hermeticity, 
permission. <laughs> and then it's printing that result. Now let's do the end only end. So here we go. If x a x If this is real, which means those are the same, then I want to prove that the operator is remission. Okay? So we can take this and we can say, okay, um, well, if I want to switch these two, then I just switch them and lose the complex conjugation. All right? And now I'm going to move A over to the second one. Okay. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract this minus this, which is going to be what is this equal to? Zero for all x. Well, if this is zero for all x, what can you tell me about that operator? It's also equal to zero. It's what? It's equal to zero matrix. How do you know that? Right there. Okay. You see what I'm pointing at over there? Some of you are looking down writing. We're using this. So for that to be zero, A has to be a dagger. Okay? We good? Sweet. Okay, and then we'll prove the second one. For the second one, we'll say I have an eigenvalue expression. And then what I can do is say, okay, I'm going to take the inner product of x with ax. But this is ax, which is the eigenvalue times x, so we can just replace that with lambda x. Of course, lambda is just a number, so you can always pull it out of this complicated inner product thing. So this is just lambda x x, okay? But x x is just the square of the magnitude of x, okay? Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. If I grab this and this, that tells me that lambda is this over that. Is this real? How do you know? Because you just proved it. Yeah, I just proved it. <laughs> What about this? Is this real? Yeah. 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 Okay. So this is real. These are real. Okay. So obviously Hermitian operators are going to play a huge role in physics. Okay. And part of it is the mathematical power that they bring, but it's also that there's this really nice sort of restriction to real quantities emerging in certain instances. Depends on what questions you ask. Okay. So for example, you know, the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real. Are the eigenvectors of a Hermitian operator real? No, not in general. I mean, it's a linear transformation in a complex vector space. You can have real vectors in a complex vector space, just have the imaginary part be zero, but generally speaking, the eigenvectors of a Hermitian operator are going to be complex. So it's not like just because it's Hermitian, everything becomes real, but there are certain quantities which are forced to be real, okay? And those can be directly interpreted as physically measurable quantities. Are they spinners? Yeah, like they're not base vectors that would act 
No, these are not, well, no, these are not spatial vectors. They're complex vectors. Um, so, yeah, so if you're asking me about a spinner, um, so a spinner is a complex, it's a complex vector space, okay, because most spinners have complex components, um, but it doesn't have the space-time interpretation that a, uh, a vector has in the sense that a vector points in a direction in space. So, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. There's no direct coordinate com coordinate connection to a spinner as there is to a vector. Because what can you say? You can say if I have coordinates, then the coordinates in a space form the basis for all vectors in the space. They don't form the basis for spinners. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, with spinners, you can't say, I mean, there is a certain sense in which you might argue a spinner is a complex vector. We can measure spinners. We can see spin. You, well, what can you measure about a spinner? I mean, you, you, you can't actually touch it and like, look at this complex vector. It's really full. No, you measure, you know, it's deflection in a stern gerlach experiment or something like that. But in that case, you're measuring an angle, and angles are certainly real. Okay? Um, okay. So now it is time and something that some of you have probably been expecting, to expand the class of operators to include another set. And then I'm going to tie everything together. But first, I'm going to introduce a new set of operators. I don't know why my mask won't stay up today. I think my beard, my beard is pulling it down. Um, anyway, so we've got self-adjoint operators. which are permission and symmetric. Now we're going to introduce the following. Okay, so remember, we've introduced self-adjoint. Which is symmetric for real and permission. Or complex vector spaces upon which they act. Now we're going to introduce the notion of isometries. These will be very closely defined, but not exactly in the same way. They play an incredibly important role, which some of you have probably already seen. I'm going to lay out their properties, and then I'm going to link them up with those. So here we go. For a linear transformation, all of these, it doesn't matter what properties I'm giving them or exploring, they're all linear transformations. They can be represented by matrices that act on vectors. They can also be represented by matrices. So these are all linear operators. For a linear transformation U on an inner product space, V, we define the following. If V is complex and the transformation U and its adjoint combined with the original transformation gives me the identity, then U is called what? Unitary. Unitary, exactly. If V is real and U transpose U gives you the identity, because permission conjugation just becomes transposing if it's all real, then U is called what? <laughs> then U is called. Uh, that's symmetric. Come on, guys. What, what kind of matrix is a rotation? <laughs> it's an orthogonal. That's 
special orthogonal? Yes. Sorry, is that again? This is the book's notation for transpose. So if you have a matrix and you swap everything across the diagonal, that's transposing. He uses a twiddle. I'm trying to be consistent with the book. Although I obviously prefer that for transpose, and I might occasionally do it, but I'm trying to stick with the book right now. This does kind of look like this, especially if you're drunk. <laughs> it's a T! It's a T! Always oh, sure it's a bigger T! So anyway, uh, <laughs> so the twill at least you won't get ever mistaken for the, the dagger. Anyway, okay. Uh, both of these are isometric. Man, I don't know why my mask keeps jumping down my face today. This is the weirdest thing. Anyway, okay. All right. So these are a set of definitions, obviously, so we can just take them and go with them. No reason to pause. Um, with these definitions, there are some really obvious conclusions that you can draw. For example, if you, if you, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Hold on a second. Pause. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so these are, these are four of these matrices in particular. So if I dagger the daggered version of the matrix, I just get back the original thing. But remember that U dagger is acting as the inverse. Okay. So daggering and inversing, same thing in this case, okay? That is definitely not true for these, okay? I mean, the dagger of the dagger is definitely the original matrix, but in terms of identifying the dagger with the inverse, that's not gonna happen for these matrices or these operators, but it's true for these operators. And I can use dagger in general because this is daggered, it's just it also reduces to the transpose because there's no complex element, okay? All right, um, now we haven't used the inner product yet, so let's see what the inner product will get us. So U, this is an isometric matrix, on an inner product space, satisfies the following. One, U dagger U equals the identity. That's a given, okay? That's almost part of the definition. But I'll play a game in just a moment. Two, if I take the inner product of U acting on the first vector and U acting on the second vector, this actually just gives me back the inner product of the two vectors. The U's disappear. Okay, and this is true for all x and y. Three, if I am finding the magnitude of the transformation of a vector, well, that's equal to the magnitude of the original vector, and this is true for all x. And what you can argue is that if you accept one of these, the other two have to be true. Okay? And it doesn't matter which one you accept. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take this one as given and we're going to use that to prove these two. And then I'll end by taking this one as given and using this to prove this. So here we go. Um, all right, so, oh yeah, here we go. 
So I've got u dagger u equals the identity. And now I want to consider ux ui. Now what do you think I'm going to do with one of these u's? Yeah, I'm going to move it to the end of term because I can always do that as long as I use the adjoint. Okay. But what is u dagger u? The identity. The identity. So this is just going to be x and y. For any x and y. Boom! Done. Pretty sweet, right? Pretty sweet. <laughs> Dope sweet. Uh, OK. Um, well, if I take this and I set x equals to y, then what this means is that ux ux equals, well, this is ux squared, but that equals xx, which is the magnitude of x squared. So once we prove this, it's trivial to prove this. Okay? So now all we have to do is complete the cycle. We have to start with 3 and then prove 1. Shouldn't be that hard, should it? Somebody want to come up here and do it. Here, I'll just draw a card and let somebody come up here and do it for me. I know, you know whose card's on top, right? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh. uh, do, do you want to come up and do it for me? Right there, there. All right. Okay, go. Proof that three leads to one. I'm not doing it. I'm not a TikTok lover. TikTok, 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 TikTok. This is really important. He's saying that this is equal to this. So does that mean that this is the identity? No, I know you have to say it's the identity for all that. because it's reduced to that. Well, remember when we had like, uh, I erased them, but we had like the inner product of uh, Isn't it so obvious that A is zero? Well, no, we had to prove it. It's for all x. It is for all x. Yeah. This is for all x as well. So you can't just identify that this is the identity just because that plays the same role as 1 in this expression because it's built into a complicated expression in the inner product. So you've got that a little bit more. But you've you got, you got some important stuff set up. Sorry, say it, say it again. Okay, I'm just gonna. Oh, oh come on up, guys. Is, come on up. Is like here to here an okay step? Yeah, oh, that's always okay that, because like, that's, the the that? that's the definition of the adjoint is that you can move it from one item in the inner product to another as long as you 
Okay, cool. That's valid. you're doing. So he's saying if you, so he subtracted them. Scoot over so they can see. Yeah, don't sit down. So he subtracted them and that gave him u dagger u minus the identity on x, x equals zero. Now we can grab one of those results and say if this is zero for all x, then what is this thing? So what is so this is zero. Yeah. Okay. Well, for this to be zero, u dagger u is equal to the identity. That's that's a given. Okay. All right. Um, Why did we set it equal? Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. We are dealing with. We're dealing with not necessarily complex unitary transformations. We could be dealing with orthogonal transformations. So, so this could be real. This vector space that this story is playing out on could be real. But if the vector space is real, what must be true about this operator? In order for this being zero means that the operator is zero. The dagger equals the inverse. That what? The dagger equals the inverse. No. It's got to be self-adjoint. Self so can you prove that that is self-adjoint? If you prove that that is self-adjoint, then this being zero means that that is zero. Okay, I'm using those three things that I started out class with and then I erased very quickly, stupidly. Carry on. Prove that that's self adjoint. Oh, God. You can do it. Just write it down and then adjoin it. See if you can manipulate it back into what it was. So, so you write right. U minus I. Okay. Put brackets around it. Dagger the shit out of the whole thing. <laughs> and now distribute that dagger. Distribute the dagger. If you dagger a product of matrices, what must you do to the matrices if you want to have individual daggers? You have to flip them. So this is actually u dagger, and this is u dagger dagger. Oh, but, but that's that. Isn't u dagger dagger just Yes, oh, cool. it is. Okay. And whoa, that equals the same thing as the thing. Exactly. Oh, I don't. Boom. Oh. Nice. Thank you, sir. That was excellent. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. All right. Oh man, I I, I didn't I didn't turn your cards, so the next question is going to be yours as well. <laughs> uh, no more proofs. Okay. Uh, Particle all over again. All right. <laughs> I gotta want people to take GR next semester, so. About okay. <laughs> At any rate, um, okay. So, uh, so isometries are transformations which clearly um, maintain the length of vectors that they're transforming. If I transform the vector x by uh, an isometry, well, that resulting vector, which I can call y has the same magnitude as the vector I started with, okay? So isometries preserve length. They also preserve angles between vectors. 
We can show that by reminding ourselves of how we define the cosine between two, or the cosine of the angle between two vectors with the inner product. Okay? Well, if I do an isometric transformation of all the vectors in this definition, Well, holy shit, that reduces to that, and that reduces to that, okay? Sorry, that's going to that, and it equals what we started with, okay? Well, so what? I mean, who cares? It preserves the angle between vectors. What does that really matter? Yeah, but why, why is it important? Well, they are neat, but why is it important that it preserve the angle between vectors as well as their length? It describes the limit of transformation. Preserve relative analogy. Exactly. What is one of the most underlyingly important ingredients to build in a vector space? You need to build an orthonormal basis in the space. Because that so simplifies calculations. If you do inner products, you don't get cross terms. Everything is diagonal, okay? Well, an isometric transformation takes an orthonormal basis and gives you back another orthonormal basis because every vector has the same size and every 90 degree angle is still a 90 degree angle, okay? So this is one of the reasons why Isometric transformations are a highly used set of transformations because they preserve the orthonormal basis that we're working with in any given setting. Now, going back to eigenvalues for a minute, we can, uh, let me think. Okay, so going back to eigenvalues for a minute, I'm gonna give two more results, and then I'm gonna draw a picture that puts it all together. So first of all, I'm gonna go back to self-adjoint transformations for a moment, because one of the things we learned was that for Hermitian matrices, their eigenvalues were real. You might ask yourself the question, what about for a symmetric matrix? Is its eigenvalues always real? And I know what you might think. You might think, well, it's a real matrix, so obviously the eigenvalues are real. But remember the rotation operator, which is not, it's not symmetric. A rotation operator is rather orthogonal. But a rotation operator has eigenvalues which are imaginary or complex, okay? So let us ask, in general, or for a symmetric matrix as well as a Hermitian, is there something you can say about the eigenvalues being real? And what you can say is, if A is self-adjoint, then all of its eigenvalues are real. This means it applies to both symmetric and Hermitian matrices. Okay, now let me run to a quick proof. If so we have AX equals lambda X for X not equal zero, then we can say X AX is X lambda X, which is lambda X X. But if A is equal to A dagger, then X A X, I can shift the A over to the first X and then use the self adjointness. And then if the 
operator acts on the first x and gives you an eigenvalue of lambda, since that's a constant multiplying the first term in the inner product, it comes out with a complex conjugation. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I just proved that those were the same. So lambda equals lambda star, which means that lambda is real. Okay? So in general, something we can say about the eigenvalues of self-adjoint matrices is that they're always real. Can we say the same about isometric matrices? Yes, thank you. I was going to draw a card. Yeah, I'm so glad. <laughs> we were going to go down that. Yeah, no, there are isometric matrices with imaginary and complex eigenvalues. So can we say anything about those eigenvalues? Well, it turns out we can. Okay? Here's what we can say about the eigenvalues of an isometric matrix. Isometric transformations have an absolute value of one. Well, holy shit. They might be imaginary, but damn, their magnitude is one. Yeah. Let's prove it. If U is an isometry, and Ux equals lambda x, or x not equal to zero, then the magnitude of x is the same as the magnitude of the transformed version of x, which is the magnitude of the eigenvalue times the magnitude of the vector. Well, hold, hold on. That is equal to that. That's pretty interesting. Remember the eigenvalues of that rotation matrix? What are they again? What's the magnitude of e to the i theta? It's one. Okay. These are, um, right? Yes. Um, like if I sonically define sort of like for anything with that, the algebra term? Or is no, there's a certain, so you have to be looking at a certain type of, so these transformations are, um, this is a broader class of transformations than the transformations that can be reduced to a Lie algebra because the transformations that can be reduced to a Lie algebra have to be elements of a Lie group. And a Lie group is a set of transformations which is continuous, they form a manifold. These might be a discrete set of transformations. So, so you can't say Lie algebra comes in this story for all of these transformations, but certainly for the subclass of them it does. Okay. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna draw a picture. I know, pictures are so badass, and we're going to unify everything, because right now I keep saying, you know, isometries are different than self-adjoints. They're defined differently. Everything is just so different. And now I'm gonna link them. And this could be a really cool story 
if it was in any way, shape, or form, fantastic. But unfortunately, it is completely and totally normal. Okay, here we go. In summary, we have the following. U dagger equals U, which is our definition of self-adjoint. And then we have U dagger U is the identity, which is our definition of isometry. Okay? Now, if we're dealing with a real, and I'm just reviewing all the stuff that I've given you. I'm just going to put it up on the board at once. If I'm dealing with a real vector space, then these are called symmetric transformations. If I'm dealing with a complex vector, vector space or a unitary space, then these are called Hermitian. Over here, if I'm dealing with a real vector space, then these are called orthogonal. And if I'm dealing with a complex vector space, then these are called unitary. Okay? Important properties here, all eigenvalues, Of magnitude one. An important property here, all eigenvalues are real. Okay? So these are two different stories, and I would like to know how, if at all, they can be united. All right? Well, let me ask you a question. In this case, what is the commutator of u and u dagger? Zero. It's zero? Are you sure? U dagger equals, but u dagger equals u, u, u dagger, so it doesn't mean zero. Yeah, if u dagger is equal to u, then you're taking the commutator of something with itself. That's always zero. Folks, the commutator is the product in the first order minus the product in the second order. I hope to God that's zero. Okay? So it turns out that in this case, u and u dagger commute. You think we can say something similar here? Yeah. Yes, we can. U and u dagger, in this case, well, what is it? It's u, u dagger minus u dagger u. What's u, u dagger? What's u dagger u? Okay. Well, this can lead us to a very useful definition. And if you don't laugh, I'm going to kick all of your asses. A linear transformation satisfying that A dagger A equals A A dagger is normal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in all honesty, so this is a large class of operators that includes both self-adjoint operators as well as isometric operators. Okay? What else does you think, what else do you think it contains? I mean, do you think this set just contains these two? No, for example, it contains anti-self-adjoint. That is A equals minus A dagger. You can immediately prove that those commute. Okay? Now, here is an important result that can be proven for normal operators. 
That is, it can be proven using merely the definition of this commutivity. It doesn't need any of the details of whether it's self-adjoint or an isometry. If A is normal, which is pretty special, <laughs> then the eigenvectors that belong, that belong, but the word I'm using in the sentence is belonging, to distinct eigenvalues that is, if you take an operator and you find its eigenvalues and you take two different eigenvalues and you find their eigenvectors, those eigenvectors are going to be what? What do you think? Orthogonal. They're going to be orthogonal. Okay. Now we're going to start our next lecture proving this, but I just want to point out if your matrix is normal, so if it's a self-adjoint, anti-self-adjoint, if it's isom isometric, then if you find the eigenvalues and the number of eigenvalues is equal to, well, actually, sorry, the number of eigenvalues is always equal to the dimensionality of the matrix. So if you have a three by three matrix, you're gonna get three eigenvalues. If all three of your eigenvalues are distinct, then what can you tell me about all of the eigenvectors? They form a basis, and if you normalize them, it's an orthonormal basis. But they're always orthogonal, okay? All right, I'll see you guys next Tuesday.